everyone. Today we are going to see the topic periodontal dressings. Most of you would have seen a periodontal dressing being given after uh, routine periodontal surgical procedures. So we can define periodontal dressing as a surgical dressing that is applied over and protecting the wound produced by periodontal surgical procedures. The concept of periodontal dressing was introduced by A.W. Ward in 1923. Let's see what are the functions of a periodontal dressing. The primary function of periodontal dressing is the protection of the surgical site. Now, protecting the surgical site, thereby promoting healing, is what is mentioned in the literature. But uh, how far periodontal dressing promotes healing is somewhat doubtful. Also, another important function is increasing the post-surgical patient comfort. Many patients feel secure when you have a dressing applied over the surgical site. Various other functions have been mentioned in the literature regarding the use of uh, periodontal dressings. Those include hemostasis, then stabilizing displaced flaps, splinting mobile teeth, retention of uh, locally applied drugs and desensitization of exposed root surfaces. Now, among these functions, uh, the function of achieving hemostasis as well as uh, splinting of mobile teeth are uh, questionable functions. Also, the desensitization of exposed root surfaces. Now, as long as the dressing is in place, uh, the patient will not feel sensitivity, but uh, please note that Periodontal dressing is not used as a treatment of dentinal sensitivity. Now, you can obviously stabilize uh, displaced flaps, especially a pikily displaced flap, uh, using a periodontal dressing. Also, uh, following local drug delivery, especially with the use of uh, non resorbable local drug delivery devices, you can uh, give a periodontal dressing as a protection. Now, periodontal dressings can be broadly classified into eugenol containing dressings and non-eugenol dressings. Now, eugenol uh, containing dressings are conventionally zinc oxide eugenol dressings. Uh, they are available either as a powder and liquid or in the base form. Now, the powder and liquid forms, the prototypes were the Kirkland pack and the Watts Wonder pack, which are no longer the uh, available. Now, when it comes to the paste form, you have a two-paste system where you have a base paste which contains uh, zinc oxide, then fixed vegetable or mineral oil, and an accelerator paste which contains eugenol, rosins, fillers, resinous balsam, and lanolin. Now, the setting reaction is the reaction between zinc oxide and eugenol, leading to the formation of zinc eugenolate. Now, the advantages of uh, zinc oxide eugenol dressings are one is it can be mixed in large quantities and stored, which you may be familiar uh, when you mix the temporary filling material. And uh, once mixed, they assume a firm consistency, which is quite easy to manipulate. And uh, most importantly, it is very economical. However, the disadvantages of uh, zinc oxide eugenol actually outweigh the advantages. Some of the important disadvantages are the persistent taste of eugenol in the mouth for a long period of time. Also, uh, the setting reaction of uh, zinc oxide and eugenol results in the release of residual eugenol, which has been found to interfere with the healing, especially of uh, bone. Also, uh, the zinc oxide eugenol, they set with sharp edges, and these sharp edges can irritate the mucosa and can often cause uh, ulcerations. Coming on to the non-eugenol dressings, you have the uh, two-paste system, then you have the single-paste system, then you have uh, collagen-based dressings, metacrylic gel dressings, cyanacrylates, and lightweight dressings. Now, the two-paste systems, uh, the most uh, popular ones are the Copac, uh, Periocare, uh, you have Ocopac, then single pay system, you have Peripac and Risopac. Then uh, cyanacrylates, you have brands like Amcrylate. Then uh, light cure dressing uh, is available in the commercial name Barricade. 
and uh, these are some of the pictures of the different types of dressings. I hope uh, everyone is familiar with Copac, which is uh, the most commonly used periodontal dressing. Then you have the Risopac. Risopac is uh, quite aesthetic. It is a resorbable type of periodontal dressing, but uh, its duration uh, of uh, the Risopac in the oral cavity is quite limited. It will get uh, resorbed within a couple of days. Then you have the barricade. Barricade, again, you can see it's quite aesthetic uh, and it is used in the anterior areas. Now coming on to Copac. Copac is the most commonly and widely used periodontal dressing. In fact, uh, in uh, many literature, Copac is used as a synonym for periodontal dressing. It is usually supplied as the toothpaste system or as an automation system contained within a syringe. Now, the ingredients of Copac, uh, you have a toothpaste system, you have a pink paste as well as an amber colored paste. Now, the pink paste contains zinc oxide, magnesium oxide, peanut oil, mineral oil, rosin oil, and uh, bacterostatic agents. And the second paste, that is an amber colored paste, contains polymerase rosin, coconut fatty acid, chlorothymol, and Peruvian bars. And when these two pastes are mixed together, you have a setting reaction occurring between a metallic ion, that is the magnesium oxide, and the coconut fatty acids. Now, the mixing and application of uh, Copac, uh, for that case, any two paste system, periodontal dressings, uh, you have a similar pattern of mixing. Now, you take or dispense equal lengths of each paste into the mixing pad. Okay, it is always preferable to use a mixing pad instead of a glass lab. Okay, so you have to take equal lengths of both paste, the base paste and the accelerator paste. Now, the length of the paste required depends on the extent of your surgical site. Like, uh, you take, suppose you have done surgery on six teeth, you take the that much length of the paste, of both paste, you take that much length, dispense onto the mixing pad. Please remember this is for applying the dressing on both sides, both the labial side as well as the lingual or the palatal side. So if dressing is required only on one side, you can take half the length of the surgical side. Now, this is after dispensing onto the mixing pad, it is mixed with a plastic spatula or a wooden tongue uh, depressor. Again, it is preferable not to use a metallic spatula. And the mixing is a routine circular motion, no specific uh, mixing motion is recommended, just a circular motion until you get a uniform or a homogeneous color. Now, in olden days, people used to incorporate tetracycline powder or chlorhexidine powder into the mix to, you know, provide some kind of antibacterial effect to the dressing, but those uh, systems are no longer followed. And after mixing, you check for tackiness with moistened gloved fingers. Okay, see whether it is sticking onto your fingers. And uh, to accelerate the setting reaction, you can immerse the mixed dressing into a cup of sterile cold water. Okay. And the next step is once properly set, you roll it into sufficient length, like the thickness of a pencil inside your palms. Okay. So this is the stepwise. So this is what we mentioned about Copac. You have the pink colored paste and the amber colored paste. Dispense it onto a mixing pad. You mix it using a wooden spatula until you get a uniform color and you can immerse it into a cup of sterile cold water to accelerate the setting reaction. Now, prior to applying the dressing, you have to lubricate the patient's lips with petroleum jelly or Vaseline can be used because otherwise it will stick to the patient's face and especially for uh, male patients with moustache and beard and all, 
might be a problem. Later on, it will be difficult to remove the dressing. And uh, you have to make sure that, see, uh, when we mentioned about the functions, uh, it was mentioned as, uh, one of the function was mentioned as hemostasis. Please remember it is, you should not use a periodontal dressing to control bleeding from a site. You have to make sure you control the bleeding prior to applying the periodontal dressing. Dry the area. Now, you uh, you would have already rolled it into uh, the size of a pencil inside your palms and inside your hands. So, you place the roll at the cervical area of the teeth and you wrap it around the most distal tooth. Uh, suppose you have done surgery of an entire quadrant. Okay. You start place the dressing from the anteriors and uh, you uh, place the roll keep on slightly adapting the roll at the cervical area to the posterior teeth and once you reach the distal most tooth, if it, suppose if it is uh, second molar or is third molar, you wrap it around the distal most tooth. You adapt to the surgical side by gently pressing and in a similar way, the second roll is placed on the lingual or the palatal surface as a continuation of the initially placed roll. Now you adapt it to the interproximal sites using the back of a curate or your uh, tweezers uh, so that it gets some kind of mechanical locking. Okay. The dressing uh, is retained in place by means of a mechanical locking in the interdental areas or the interproximal areas. Okay. So this is the diagrammatic representation. The tool, you adapt it at the cervical area, you roll it around the posterior most tooth, then you apply the second portion on the lingual or the palatal aspect. And after initially adapting it onto the cervical area, you do the muscle trimming, just like what you do when you take your impressions. Okay, so the muscle trimming is basically done to avoid overextension of the pressing material so that it does not impinge onto the mucosa. Now, the extent of the dressing is very important. Apically, as far as possible, it should be confined within the mucogingival junction. That is, it should not extend beyond the mucogingival junction to the mucosa. As we saw with the eugenol dressing, see, eugenol dressings, many times what happens is, uh, you know, uh, the sharp edges will cause uh, ulceration or laceration of the mucosa. With uh, copac and all, mostly uh, what you see is the dressing might get dislodged. Okay. It can also cause ulcerations if it is extending or impinging on the frenum and all. The next time the patient comes, you will probably see an ulcer on the frenum. And the coronal extent is also important. It should not extend beyond the middle third of the crown. Or the dressing must remain within the height of contour of the tooth. Okay. And it should not interfere with the opposing tooth. You have to check the occlusion because uh, if it is interfering with the occlusion, as it gets hardened, once the dressing becomes hard, it can uh, sometimes cause trauma from occlusion. That is also important. And when you are doing soft tissue grafts, soft tissue procedures, you can place a sterile dry foil or an aluminum foil onto the site before placing the dressing. See, the purpose of this uh, placing this aluminum foil is to avoid the knots of your sutures getting incorporated into the dressing. Okay. So, what will happen is if the knots get incorporated into the dressing material, when you are removing the dressing, the knots or the suture might be pulled through the tissues. So, in the case of soft tissue procedures, when you do treatment of recession and all, this step is very important. Placement of a dry foil before or prior to placing the dressing. Now, the removal of dressing is also important. Okay, Usually, you have different uh, time periods of removing the dressing. Routinely, uh, or in any case, periodontal dressings are removed only after a minimum period of one week. Okay, for any periodontal procedure, a minimum of one week is required for uh, suture removal. So, 
to keep the dressing at least for a period of one week. Okay. So first, what you can do is you loosen the dressing by inserting a explorer or a scaler or a probe between the pack and the tissue. And if you have placed the pack on both sides, both palatal and lingual, I mean uh, palatal and buccal or labial sides, you first remove the pack from the palatal or the lingual aspects. Okay. Uh, now the reason for this is if the suture nodes, okay, when you have tied the suture nodes on the buccal or the labial side, uh, if you remove the buccal portion of the pack first, again the sutures might have a tendency to pull through the tissue. So you first remove the palatal or the lingual pack, then you clean the surgical site with saline, irrigate with saline to remove the debris. Then the sutures are cut from the palatal side, then you remove the pack from the facial side. So along with the facial portion of the pack, the sutures will be automatically pulled out. Okay. Once the sutures are cut, they will easily uh, you know, come off along with the pack, then cleanse the buccal side. Okay. Then you evaluate the healing and uh, depending on the nature of healing. Some, sometimes if the area has not healed properly, you may need to repack the area. So this is regarding the placement of periodontal dressing as well as the removal of periodontal dressing. And in this context, one thing has to be noted is uh, in the current uh, periodontal concepts, the uh, giving a periodontal dressing is not considered mandatory. Okay, unless uh, patient comfort warrants, giving a periodontal dressing is not a mandatory procedure. You have to decide on case by case. Usually, you give dressings for excisional procedures like when you have done gingivectomy at all, usually you will give a periodontal dressing. Now for routine flap surgical procedures, a periodontal dressing is not considered mandatory. So that's regarding periodontal dressings. Thank you.